How's everybody doing? Good. I'm doing great. I have. I I thank thank you. Yeah, I've worked hard on it. It's called Don't Travel. <laughs> so seriously, I took two months off, and and the doctor threatened me, and I said, okay, I will obey. And so I'm at that state. I'm not quite done. So I'm at that stage where I don't want to buy new clothes, but they still hang big. So apologies on that. Anyway, enough about me. Um, so for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Alan Clark. I work for SUSE. Um, but I spend my time out in the open source communities and been doing that for many, many years. And in part of uh, several uh, open source communities and foundations and participate in those. And so um, I thought it would be fun to talk about what's going on in the open source world around edge computing. Um, so I put this together just for, for grins. But before we get into it, I, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's a beautiful place if you like the outdoors. If you like the nightlife, it's kind of mediocre. Robert's going to laugh because he knows. But uh, for the outdoor enthusiasts, it's, it's pretty amazing. We have five national parks, and the government keeps trying to turn the rest of the state into a national park, so there's always tension there. But one of the famous ones is called Zion's National Park. Has anybody been there? Okay, you've been there, and you've been there. What was your favorite hike? Do you remember any of the hikes you went on? They were all awesome. They're all awesome. Okay. Well, it turns out this is a picture of what's called Angel's Landing. Did you, if you did Angel's Landing, you wouldn't have forgotten it. Didn't do Angel's Landing? Oh, you missed it. Um, so this is a picture of what's called Angel's Landing. Um, let me flip over to the Google one here and see if I can do this successfully. So this is a picture of it from Google. And what you can see here is it's, it's a fin. So you hike up this little canyon, and you come out here on the top. And when you hike out on, on here, you're basically, it's about this wide. <laughs> and you have edges on four sides. So it's, you know, I love this guy's comment. It's scary, but it's worth it, you know. Worth it all the way to the top. They actually have chains. So I'll show you some pictures here of chains you hang on to so you don't fall off the mountain. So it's called Angel's Landing. Uh, it's a very popular hike in the park. Let me see if I can get rid of that. But uh, so I want to, I'm going to use some analogies from, from that hike here. But I want to talk about, well, let's talk about edge. And I guess the first place to start is to define it. Because edge is all over the map, quite honestly. Everybody's got a definition of edge. But if you boil it down, and we're going to try to boil it down a little bit today, if you boil it down, what you're really trying to do is deliver computing capabilities further out, right? Go out to the edge of today's network and push that boundary out to um, services and push services and applications out to that edge of your network as far as you can go. Because what we have out there is a lot of sensors gathering data and information. And those sensors are becoming much more smarter, right? And we'll talk about this. But you're trying to push that out there in a way that's cost effective and reliable, okay? So you're trying to shorten that distance from your core data center out to those devices. And you want to be able to serve them, reducing your network hops mitigating the latency and bandwidth constraints, and I'll talk a, a little bit about those. Okay. And what's happening, because we're getting that increased compute power further out, it's creating new applications and new services, and we'll talk about those. So basically, what we're doing is we're distributing our computing power further out, right, from just a traditional data center. But it's, it's kind of hard to talk about edge, because what I, as I mentioned, there's lots of edges out there, right? 
And that's what creates the confusion is we're saying, oh, I'm talking about edge. And, but in your mind, the edge could be very different than the edge that somebody else in the room is talking about, right? So there's many different types of edges. So you've got, but it's kind of a progression from your, core, you know, the, your core center, right? I'll call it the core, the, the, your data center, and you're moving out. You're creating edge data centers. So you're distributing, what ends up happening is you're distributing your data centers out. They might not be big and huge, but you're kind of pushing those data centers out there to the point that you create this infrastructure edge and you end up having aggregation points because the further out you go and the more points you have, you end up having to aggreg aggregate things together and they call that an aggregation edge. You've got an access edge. Then we push out further, you've got this device edge, right? Which typically ends up what we call IoT, inter Internet of Things kind of stuff. This is when you're getting out to those extreme edges with your sensors and actuators and so forth. But it turns out you're gathering a lot of data out there, right? So lots of edges out there. Which brings me back to Angel's Landing. So the reason I pointed out Angel's Landing is it has lots of edges. It's nothing but edges, right? And what's funny is, uh, well, it's not funny, actually. Um, as I mentioned, there's this chain, and you'll see this in a couple pictures. It's a very hard hike. It's a scary hike, but it's the most popular hike in Zion's National Park. So it's kind of, I don't know why. I guess it's so beautiful when you get up there. Um, but, it, but people die. We lose tourists every year. Um, they fall off this thing and die. So last year, the uh, local newspaper in Salt Lake, the Salt Lake Tribune, actually published an article that said eight reasons why you shouldn't hike Angel's Landing. And all it did was cause more people to go hike Angel's Landing. <laughs> so anyway, so we're going to talk about some of the reasons why you should not hike Angel's Landing as we go along here. So the first one... Um, they said, you know, okay, clue number one that you shouldn't hike Angel's Landing is that if you feel ill, don't attempt it. There's really no margin of error for dizziness, right? If you get dizzy, you're going to fall off. So, so my question, you know, I looked at it and said, okay, so what is it about edge that make, that's so inviting, right? We've had sensors and stuff out there for years and years and years. Why is edge so inviting? So I thought we should talk about some use cases, and the first one that comes to mind is this notion called frictionless shopping. Have you guys heard that term? Is that a new one? So frictionless shopping, right? Basically, modern consumers, that's you and me, our tastes are changing, right? We've gotten our smartphones. We've, we've realized how easy and simple it should be for me to buy something, right? And... We like convenience. We like it now. We like speed. Uh, we want it easy. We want fast checkout. I don't necessarily want to have to interact with somebody, you know, just tap my phone and, and walk out the door kind of stuff, right? That's where we're heading. Well, if you think about that environment, that means a lot more compute power, right? Used to be you just had the guy at the front at the cash register. It could be, you know, an old hand crank machine or whatever. It didn't have to be that high tech. But nowadays, it's getting much more automated to the point we're talking about stores that have no employees. You walk in, swipe your card, it tracks, the store is tracking you and, you know, knows what you pick up and put in your basket and we walk out and it charges you, right? No interaction whatsoever. Um, so very different type of journey. But basically what frictionless shopping is trying to do is create that seamless process from start to beginning. A um, couple of anecdotes. I was reading some articles on it. I've been reading a ton of articles, but one that I found very interesting is some of the things that are, that are happening in this space. So we, we look at it and say, okay, it's nice and seamless shopping for us. The retail shops are looking at this going gold mine of information right? Um, they're tracking you. They, uh, one food chain is talking about smart shelves. They're putting cameras and sensors on these shelves. So you walk up, 
look at a shelf of items, they're tracking your eye movement, they're tracking how long you stand there, they're tracking which products you looked at, which ones you picked up, and then which one you actually picked up and walked away with. Treasure trove of data there, right? They know more about you <laughs> than you may realize that you even know about yourself. In fact, one article I read, they talked about, they were, uh, they were talking about these uh, retail stores that are going to be fully automated, and they're asking them the question about, aren't you worried about people just shoplifting? And the response was, we actually get more out of the data than they could ever sh take from shoplifting. <laughs> I was like, okay, that means that data is very valuable, right? You think about it, though. If they know you stood at that front of that aisle and scanned the items and then picked one, that's very valuable to go back to the manufacturer to tell them, you know, what they should do, you know, how to change the product to become more attractive to you. So that's very valuable data. But with that data sitting out there on the edge, right, so if that retail store is out there on the edge, that's a ton of data, right? That's, that's tough on a network. If you're trying to transport that back uh, all at once without doing some kind of munging on it, reducing it down, you're going to clog the network. It's going to be very, very expensive. You know, even a simpler case, um, Delta Airlines has started the... Uh, has anybody done uh, international out of Atlanta with Delta Airlines? You can walk up and they just do a face scan. You no longer have to hand them your passport and your boarding ticket. They just do a face scan and print out your boarding pass, right? You have to do that real time. You can't transfer, read your face, transfer that to some distant location and do real time processing and bring it back, right? You have to do that compute out there at the edge. So you, you can't have that long latency. Anyway, this is a really fascinating area. We're going to see dramatic changes in the way services are delivered to us um, for shopping. The, the second area that I find very interesting is called augmented workforce, and this scares people. I think I find it pretty intriguing. But the idea here is... We're, we're trying to exp they're trying to expand the vision of the workforce, right? We're trying to eliminate the menial tasks and automate those and use human us in better capacity, right? Um, has anybody seen the drones running around Walmart or Home Depot, I think, has them? No, it's Lowe's. Um, they actually have robots that run around and scan the aisles. Right, and they'd create a task list of everything that's, you know, what's empty on on the shelf, what's misplaced, and they just essentially create a task list that they go. Then the worker can come along, and you know, if the item's empty, he comes up with the cart full of stuff, and he's prepared and much more efficient. Um, some of them I've seen actually interact with the customers. You can walk up and say, "Hey, I'm trying to find item X, Y, Z." and the robot will take you to the item, okay? That's augmented workforce. So um, some look at it as, as scary, but I think it's pretty exciting. A, a third example, um, if you look at the oil industry, they've had sensors on their pipelines for years and years and years, right? So, but the thing they've run into is, well, first off, those sensors were pretty limited. But you can see why they would want um, more powerful sensors out there. Because if a pipe breaks, it's a huge expense to them, right? If it's an oil pipeline out there in the middle of Alaska, pipe breaks, spills oil all over the ground, they've got major cleanup, right? And natural disaster kind of thing. So they, they want smarter sensors and you could you could you can you can imagine you know that they would want to track data over time not just that oh the pipe burst but flow capacities or temperature variances and all that kind of stuff if you start gathering all that data you get much more of a profile of how that pipeline is operating not whether it's safe or broken so less of a binary more of a detailed analysis of the whole function of the system. So today, a lot of those are running on these sensors that are 
transmitting data up to satellites and so forth, which is very expensive. Um, but if you can push that edge out there, start processing much of that data out at the edge, and then just send the results, right? Trim it down, send the results, you get a much better picture, a much more complete picture of what's going on in that pipeline. Then a fourth example is, would be manufacturing, okay? Um, there's a couple different examples of this. There's one we, I talked about this morning, or mentioned this morning, um, that uh, of a uh, nylon uh, fiber factory um, are putting sensors on their machines. Um, SUSE has actually got a case, uh, a customer, where they're doing the same thing. They've got 15-year-old, um, 20, 30-year-old machines, looms out there creating material, right? And you think, well, it's just material. That's what I thought when I first talked to uh, the CTO of one corporation. He says, no, 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 you don't get it. And they sell fabric to, you know, H&M, um, Victoria's Secret. I can't remember all their customers. But he says they all have their own standards for quality, for thickness. I don't know the the cloth, but it's probably there's density to the material, right? Um, I don't know how, lines per inch or something. I don't know what the standard is. Um, but they all have their different standards, right? And so they have a service agreement with with the people that are buying them the cloth from them or the material about them meeting that standard. And they have to have some way to do that. Uh, when I talked to the CTO before, they were basically doing that manually. They'd go out there every so often and take a sample and you know, measure the thickness. But So you can see how um, putting sensors on those machines, all of a sudden you've got continuous flow of data that's ensuring the quality of the material that you're producing, whether it be nylon fibers or, or cloth for you know, uh, retail clothing shops. Um, but one of the issues they, that some of these folks run into is those, those looms and so forth are old. And you're not going to go buy a new, new, if you even can, you know, buy a new loom. So, so they have some interesting challenges there where they're trying to um, put those sensors into these machines. Turns out it's actually not that hard. Um, the one customer that SUSE has that's doing this, they're actually just using Raspberry Pis with SUSE Linux Enterprise on them, uh, as, you know, running sensors, and then they just pump that data back through their network. So it doesn't have to be that complicated, right? So these are a lot of different types of edges, right? You can see how they're how they really vary. And we could go on. There's all kinds of use cases out there that we could have talked about. Uh, supply chains, smart cities has been in the press for the last couple of years. You know, great examples out there. Uh, remote security, vid video analytics, location services, energy. We could even go on about drones. We could go healthcare, driverless cars. We haven't talked about drivers, driverless cars. Talk about gathering data, right? Uh, those car manufacturers right now are running those test cars out there. Think about all that data that they're, they're gathering as those cars are driving around. They've got to keep all that. It's, it's petabytes of stuff. Um, remote locations, utilities, facility management, all kinds of examples. So, any questions so far or thoughts? Did I miss any good use cases that just burning? You've all heard of these before, right? So I, I don't think I'm telling you anything new, but I find it very intriguing that uh, we have that capability uh, to do this kind of stuff nowadays. So, all right, so back to uh, Angel's Landing. The second one in that article said, um, there's a chain. So let me show you the picture of the chain. Actually, I don't have it. I took it out. I apologize. Um, but I think I have one later. So there's a chain. So the last two miles, mile and a half of, of this hike is along the top of that narrow ridge. Sorry, it's not flat. It's very steep going up and like this across the ridge. And um, so what they said here is their second, their second warning was um, 
if you can't do it without the chain, you might want to reconsider. Um, and you got to remember that the chain gives you a false sense of security because it's a very popular hike. You got a thousand other people that are climbing up and down this chain at the same time you are. And so the chain's kind of whipping around. <laughs> so you're hanging onto this chain, don't want to fall off the edge, and everybody else is hanging on and they're tripping and making that chain move around. So their point is don't, tr don't just trust the chain because uh, it can jump around. So you need to make sure you've got established, stable footing on your own, right? Don't just rely on the chain. So my second point here I want to talk about is you need to establish stable footing before you get started doing edge. So as we look at these, um, all these use cases, success stories that we've just talked about, you can kind of boil all those down. There's a lot of different use cases there, a lot of different types of markets, different types of implementations, whatever. But if you sit and analyze the characteristics of those, um, it, it actually isn't that long of a list. You know, first off, you're gathering a lot of data. So you've got a lot of data growth going on here, right? The smarter those sensors are, the more um, sensing you're doing, the more data you're gathering. So you're gathering a lot of data. The amount of data growth is going to dramatically grow up, go up, okay? Second characteristic, because of that data, the amount of data that you're generating, you can't transport that back to your core. It's just too expensive and you, you can't have that time latency. So you have to push, compute as close to that data as you can, right? So you're ending up moving those workloads closer to the edge, right? Closer to the user. In the retail location, you're pushing that processing there closer to that user. You can't transport it all back. Um, so you're going to be pushing applications out to that edge to tap that data and take advantage of that data. So it's not just storing data, doing some cryptic um, calculations on it, but you're actually going to be building new applications out there on the edge. You've got to deal with latency. So the, the requirements that are coming out of the standards are saying you really got to be less than 20 millisecond latency. Okay, So the requirements are coming out of that. Um, the goal is you're trying to improve the end user's experience, right? If I walk into a retail store or go to board that plane in Delta and the thing sits there and scans for 10 minutes, I'm going to opt out and not do it, right? It goes back to us being very demanding as consumers. We don't like to wait. Um, I can't place unreasonable demands on the, on the network back to the core. That was my point. You've got all that data. I can't push it all back up to the core. I'm going to want to push some. I'm going to want to push results and so forth. I, I do need that connectivity, but I can't push everything and demand it, put more demands on the core, which means my networks have got to be smarter, right? And it means that I have to work in conjunction with the core. So think about me walking into a retail store. The retail store wants to recognize who I am, right, so I can begin my shopping experience. But I don't necessarily go to just one store. Right? If it's a chain, if it's Kroger, for example, I visit more than one Kroger store, right? So I want to have the same experience in all the stores. So some of that data, particularly the data that identifies me, has to be shared in common. That comes from the core. Processing to figure out that it is me gets done at the edge. See how that happens there? All right. So... So it's basically out there on the edge, you're, you're sensing something, processing on it, causing some action to happen is really what it boils down to. So those characteristics, if we look at those characteristics, those characteristics turn into demands, okay? Means I've got to have high service uptime, meet those customers' expectations. Um, it's kind of a two-edged sword. We're telling them we're providing them more service, you know, frictionless shopping and so forth. Their expectations go up with that, right? Uh, I've got to have stream... Wow, I read that wrong. Streamlined um, operations, right? I need to be able to 
distribute my infrastructure resources without causing demands out there on the edge it means it's, it's creating a demand for DevOps. I'm pushing applications out there. Pretty much going to be microservices kind of stuff as we get out there. So DevOps tends to fit well in that type of area. It means I'm creating critical infrastructure. I've got to have high performance. I've got to reduce that latency. I've got to improve the availability. Again, right, it goes back to those expectations that have been built up. Pushing that compute out to the edge, pushing that uh, identity type information, privacy information means I've got to address security. The smarter I get, the further out I get, the more need for security out at, the, out at that edge. And I've got to improve fault tolerance, right? All the way out to the edge. So, yep. Everybody but you. No, I'm <laughs> Yeah, questions. Go ahead. Okay. So I would argue that a lot of the use cases you're describing, especially in the retail space, are not so much moving the compute or moving workloads closer to the user. It's adding workloads closer to the user. That's true. For example, if we look at the shopping scenario you, you described, you go to multiple programs. That means that your ID, whatever they do for visual analysis or a cookie on your smartphone or whatever, they're going to recognize you. That's going to be at multiple stores. Correct. That piece has to be added to what's existing. There. That's correct. Because they're already doing that today, right? Everybody has their, their shopper card. Yep. Um, but, they, but honestly, the retailers haven't figured out what to do with that. They're just learning, right? right? And it's the learning what to do with that that's causing the compute. Right. You're, you're correct. And then eventually, they're going to take that store data. They're going to push that back up to the central office, which, by the way, this is where typical retail, all the, all the data analytics really run. They're going to take all of that information from all the shoppers, consolidate that, and then produce, okay, shelf location matters, this product yes. and field matters, and so forth. So that's why I say add as opposed to move. Yes, you're correct. They, it is a lot to add. And that was what I was trying to say with the, the oil pipeline stuff is, right, the sensors are there today. The smarts aren't, and they're, they're trying to get smarter. So that is an add. Um, actually, one thing that, that I would also mention that um, – I guess it's an ad, but um, one of the, the retail chains is talking about you go to the cooler, you, you look in the glass and see the product. They've got technology now, you know, with the opaque glass. They're actually going to start projecting and say, hey, buy a gallon of milk, or they're going to, t they're going to target you with ads on the glass on these coolers, right? So the real-time processing isn't going to just happen at the core. Right. They're going to gather and say, oh, it's Mark, and Mark likes 2% milk, so let's give him a, right, whatever. They're going to target. What? Yeah, take the door off and take it to the <laughs> register for five cents off. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, no, it's pretty cool stuff. All right. Um, any other questions? Okay. So some other things you have to consider, right, when you start thinking about those characteristics and the demands that it creates. You've got vast, the further out you go on the edge, the more number of deployments you'll end up having, right? Think about the billions of sensors that will end up being on a 100-mile pipeline, right? Or the number of retail store outlets out there. The more smarter you make it, the more there is. Um, so that's going to put, could put pressure on skills and demands in these remote and perhaps unreachable environments. And a lot of those environments, particularly today and future desires to make them zero touch, right? You don't want to have to roll the truck um, kind of thing. So you've got to consider physical designs, you've got to consider power out there, what's available, you've got to consider processing capability, that you, capacity that you can actually do, things like dirt, humidity, vibration, security, right? Second thing you've got to consider that moving data isn't free. And so I keep coming back to this whole network thing. How big of a pipe do you have? What kind of, you know, are you running on radios or are you running on, you know, T1 lines, whatever, but um, moving the data is not free, so you've got to consider what you've got out there, what you can transfer, what compute requirements you have out there, and so forth. 
Another thing you want to consider, it's very simple to, like I said, add Raspberry Pis out there to the looms, but is that a very different setup than what you have at your core? And what you're going to find out is you want consistency from an IT perspective. You want consistency from the core as far out to the edge as you can get it. Because if you don't, your costs go up, your risks go up, right? Um, if you can make that consistency, you've, you've lowered your risk, you've lowered your cost, you've increased your agility and your ability to respond, right? So think unified orchestration, think operational mechanisms, think about service management. And then think about lifecycle management. What are you going to do? You know, you put smarts out there towards the edge. You can't just put it out there and forget it. Right? So you got to think about lifecycle management on that. It might be easy to deploy, but how are you going to update it? How are you going to do that in a low-touch scenario? How are you going to manage it? How are you going to maintain it? How are you, how are you going to respond rapidly to some type of event? Um, you know, you've got a security hole or whatever. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do fast recovery? How are you going to do fault management? Now you know why the edge starts to sound a little scary because right? you have to th have to think about all those. All right, so let's go back to Angel's Landing here. There's a picture of the chain. Actually, that's not a good one. I've got a better one. I wish, I'll have to see if I've got Oh, I've got it. Um, Angel's Landing. So this is clue number three that you shouldn't go hike Angel's Landing. If you can't wait your turn, you shouldn't hike the Angel's Landing. The scariest behavior I witnessed involved impatient people trying to pass each other on the narrowest parts of the spine, waited a broader spot for unyielding oncomers. This is not the place to get territorial, okay? So don't get territorial. So this is the picture I wanted to show you, right? You ready to go hike that now? It's, think about that with, you know, 100 other people coming up and down the hill. All right, so this is, my point here is, I, this is not a place to go territorial. This is where you should be looking at open source, right? To do edge computing, you should be looking at open source. And there's a lot happening in open source around this space. So I, I, I'd like to talk about the different projects that are out there and a little bit about what's going on. And is it, have, has anybody started to try to look into what's going on with all the open source projects? It looks like chaos, honestly. Right, I, I, there's more than two dozen projects out there, and it looks like they're, and some of them are, but they look like they're competing. They look like they're totally different and solving different problems, and it's it's just strange. <laughs> but it's a new space, and you have to kind of expect that in a new space, right? So there's a lot going on, which is exciting, which tells me it's it's going to be very cool technology. So I want to talk about just a few of these. We don't have time to talk about all of them. Um, but the first thing that's happening, or the thing that's happening now, is we have these umbrella foundations that are coming into play. All right. So a lot of projects have started off out on GitHub or wherever by, by a single company or so forth. And they've realized that they've got some things in common and so they've been starting, to, beginning to coalesce under these umbrella organizations where they're starting to work together. So three examples of those, IOT, under the Eclipse organization, they've got an IOT forum um, where a bunch of those are coming together. OpenStack has the Starling X project, and then they've got an edge computing group um, that are related to each other and working together. And I'll talk about that one in a minute. And then under the Linux Foundation, um, there's edge work going on in the LF Edge area, and we'll talk about those organizations, and also under the LF Networking. So some of these started off in their own project and were later pulled together under these umbrella organizations with the effort to try to get people to, to work together and, and align what they're doing. So we've got these umbrella groups in place kind of hurting some of these projects together. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's still a lot of diversity out there. Um, so we'll talk about how some of these kind of relate to each other. So the first one I'd like to talk about, which I thought was very interesting, is a group called OpenFog. And OpenFog 
uh, has written up, I'm not sure I'd call it a standard, but they kind of a standard style document where they're describing fog computing, which I find really, uh, it was pretty, pretty interesting to, to delve into with the, tech, the, the technical end of this. But um, basically, they're creating this architecture uh, that uh, enables interoperability and scalability out to the edge. And if, you, if we look at it in detail a little bit, so they call it FOG, which is a little different than everybody else, but they call it FOG computing. But the, the vision is here that they're extending the traditional cloud-based computing system, right? So they're extending cloud out towards the edge. And by doing that, they reserve preserve those benefits that you get from cloud, right? So the identity, uh, the storage capabilities, the agility to, to manage your networks, the orchestration, right? All those positive things that you get from cloud. And the cool thing about that, as I was mentioning before, is the further out that you push the edge, the more devices you actually encompass, right? You got all those, and the more devices you got out there that you're trying to manage, the more harder that it is and the more value that a cloud brings to you. So, so some of their architectures, uh, or some of the pillars that, in, if you look at their paper, uh, that they're pushing around um, is availability, security, scalability, autonomy, and so forth, all of those, all the abilities. But if you look at their design, essentially they've, they've created a tier model a multi-tier model all the way down to the sensors and actuators. And they're pushing um, what used to be the core data center into distributed type data centers with uh, gateways and so forth. But they're basically pushing that compute power down. And so you take that raw data, do, do processing on it, and move it back up. And as you do that, what you're doing is creating more intelligence as you move into the core. Okay? So you, you munge that data out there on the edge, creating intelligence from that data, and keep pushing that upward. Does that make sense? OK. I saw some confused looks. So. Different, different types of intelligence, right? You sure. Add, you'd add extreme, sophisticated, intelligent algorithm at the bottom point of that intelligence creation that is just as smart as Overall but, but the scope of but the scope of what he knows is limited to that one sensor, or, right? Where that's where your intelligence comes in, is because I begin to aggregate that data together as I as I pull these nodes together, and the and the the pertinent the results from that aggregation creates further intelligence. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Can you go back one slide? Just sure. a quick question on that one. So the, sorry, one more. So the, the plethora of activity that you see here, I would argue that this is not so much an, a result of open source. As, as, an, as an example, look at networking technology. That's correct. So, so several, DefNet, so forth. yeah. Those were closed source, but there was a plethora until we eventually standardized on. Yeah, history. yeah, so, I, you're, and you're correct. So not all of these are open source projects. These are architectures and, and standards. So let me go on to the next slide here. And so, for example, this open fog architecture actually has been fed into the IEEE to be turned into a standard. Okay? So, on the surface, if you looked at it and didn't realize these connections existed, uh, you would think they were off doing separate things. But these guys are actually feeding in here. Um, I, or Etsy, the Etsy folks also picked up, I think that's my next slide. Yep. So the Etsy folks also picked up the work that the Open Fog, open fog guys did and uh, created a set of standards um, around what they call edge computing, right? So they're building a standardized environment around edge computing. They have built code. Well, they're trying to. I'm calling out that they're separate, uh, and I'm trying to show that that in this case we actually have standards flowing into open source, which is kind of different. Um, so, 
what started as, as some architecture has turned in, gone through some standard bodies, and these standard bodies are now feeding into open source projects. Okay? So Etsy created a, a whole bunch of uh, what they would call standards. And most of those focus around APIs, interestingly enough. So they did best practices and guidelines and use cases and requirements and so forth. But the part that I found very interesting here, and they did a reference architecture, but the part that I found very interesting here is a lot of what they worked on were APIs. Okay. So built into their standards were a bunch of set of APIs. And if you look at that, those got shot over here to an open source effort within, well, again, kind of a architecture effort, not open source, but an architecture effort within the Linux Foundation in the LF Edge group called Open API. Well, in the Linux Foundation, a group called Open API which are trying to standardize a set of APIs for our industry. And one of those they're focusing on is Edge. So the Open API folks picked up this work, put in those APIs uh, that Etsy developed, and are using those to describe um, how to do REST-based APIs for Edge computing. Okay? And then from there, if you look at the other groups within the LF Edge umbrella, they're picking up those APIs from Open API and consuming them within their open source efforts. At least they're talking about it. I haven't looked at the code. So it, there is, though it looks like a lot of chaos, there is perhaps some evolution, maybe is the right word, that's happening here, right? And the, the part that I really like about this is part of a open source is learning from each other. And I think what we're really seeing here is an evolution of people learning from what others have done instead of trying to recreate on their own. Okay. So within LF Edge, um, under the LF Edge umbrella, we've got four different projects. Um, we've got a Crano. And EdgeX Foundry, uh, we've got the Edge Virtualization Engine, and Home Edge, which is a, which is a new one from Samsung. So Crano came from AT&T. EdgeX came from, uh, initially, I believe it was Dell. I could be wrong on that one, but I think Dell kind of submitted, at least kicked that one off. And um, Crano, if you go out and look there, their big use case is focused on 5G telco space. The EdgeX Foundry are focusing on IoT style devices, right? So very different use cases. I haven't looked at the Edge Virtualization Edge and um, Home Edge. Of course, they're they're looking more at the home rack kind of device style stuff. So even though they're under the same umbrella, they're they're kind of very different. Any questions? Yeah. None of these that I am aware of have built a, a use case for healthcare. I haven't seen, doesn't mean they're not talking about it, but I haven't seen them build out a, a use case story. No, I haven't seen a hip, yeah, I haven't seen a hip. That's a good question. I, um, no, I, these guys might have some, um, but I haven't seen them. Um, the other one I'll talk about here in a minute would be um, the Eclipse folks. I think they might have looked at it, but they're, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. I'll come back on that one. But um, these guys might have a little bit out there. I don't. They. I think they might have some devices, but I don't know that they've built a, a use case to describe that scenario. That's a good point. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So let's go over to. Uh, the Eclipse Foundation. Um, this one's actually very interesting. They're very focused on the device edge. They're out there on the ex what's called the extreme edge, right? The actuators and sensors type of, type of stuff. And they've done a ton of work 
Um, I was going to inject a, a personal comment and say, sadly, some of it's done in Java, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, so they've got a bunch of projects. These are the projects within the Eclipse Foundation that, that uh, are underway. And um, they cover all kinds of areas on this. Some are very speci uh, vertical specific and with specific devices, and some are more general computing. But they're very focused on that edge device piece, right? And that's what I find interesting is now you've got the drivers to those sensors. Um, Correct. If you go earlier in your talk, you're really talking about pushing a lot more compute load, data intensity, and so forth. Well, so the, the sensors, so. yeah, there's that transition, right? Um, but what these guys are mostly focused on is those protocols to talk to the sensors. So it's not that you're storing the data per se. You don't ca usually cache a lot of data at the sensor, but, you know, you put that Arduino or Raspberry Pi or whatever close to that sensor so there's not that much latency. Um, and then you start to process it there and filter it or whatever. But a, a lot of work that's going on here, there's actually, uh, did I map that in? I didn't map that in, but a lot of these are actually running those protocols to those sensors in a standards way, yeah. So isn't there a lot of overlap with both the edges boundary? Yes. There is some overlap. Yeah, and that's why I say that's part of the chaos here is you've got, is you've got overlap on some of these. Um, and so, yeah, there'll have to be some alignment there someday, somewhere, somehow. So, yeah. No, and everything doesn't line up beautifully, unfortunately, in open source. It never does. Like I said earlier, that's really not an open source versus a closed source problem. No, it's, it's an... It's... These are eventually same, same, same here. Gonna here with the open source yeah, it's gonna. It'll eventually. That's what I say. It's eventually gonna merge. I don't know when, where, how. But the beauty is, being open source is gonna be much easier, much faster, and more rapid. Right? There'll be convergence in the market eventually. Oh, What's that? Even much easier. Oh, much, much worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an optimist. <laughs> So, okay. Um, all right. So then the next project that I, I find very interesting is, is Starling X within the OpenStack Foundation. So this is, again, the, the third umbrella. And the reason I find this one interesting, this is a, an arc, a architecture diagram uh, from the Starling X folks. And if you look at, if you look at this architecture here, they're extending the capability. Everybody knows what OpenStack is? Is there anybody that does not? Do I need to explain what? OpenStack is cloud computing, right? Um, most heavily used. It's, it's used for both public and private clouds, mostly for private clouds. But it's an infrastructure as a service cloud environment. And the interesting part about Starling here is if you look at this, what they're doing is they're leveraging those OpenStack components to build upon those. So both OpenStack and those com Kubernetes components. So you're building on the cloud, right? So the intent here is that you're extending your cloud out towards that edge, right? And so these folks are then building in the pieces that you need, right? Remember those characteristics and those demands in my list? We'll come back to them in a minute. But they're building towards fulfilling those characteristics that you have out on the edge, leveraging your cloud-based services. So they're definitely, it's not done. There's a lot of work that's got to be done because, as I noted earlier, you've got networking latency and so forth that you've got to deal with. So they're feeding a lot of feedback back into these projects saying, hey, our requirements are such that we need to do this. We need to be more distributed, right? I've got more distributed uh, data centers than just a single core kind of thing. 
got to make all those, those kinds of things work. So the beauty of this project being part of the OpenStack umbrella is they're able to work together and feed those requirements back up, right? And then again, working with the other areas, you know, for storage and, and orchestration and, and networking and so forth. So feeding in, working with these projects, not recreating them, but working with them to extend out that infrastructure. Any questions? Okay, making this, sense? This is going to scale down OpenStack for the edge. So you were talking about the retail environment. Yeah. I mean, the number of nodes needed to bring OpenStack to a retail edge is, would just not be feasible considering you know, the amount what? of cost that's needed to actually run it. The number of so what, how, are you I'm talking sure about bringing yeah. OpenStack to the edge? Target, for example, they're running they're putting big servers in every retail store, mm -hmm. running a cloud environment on there to run Kubernetes on top of that, to do exactly what Alan is showing you. So that's OpenStack as it is as of today, running in a, oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. So th in that case, they're actually running multi-cloud. So. Uh, Sorry, I forget what I said in one session versus another. You may not have a single cloud. You're more likely going to have multiple clouds kind of scenarios. But they're going to, multi-clouds going to talk to each other and work together, right? Um, but yeah, you're pushing this down. And again, it goes back to that. What's the, co the, the amount of data you're gathering, the remoteness of it, you got to factor that all in to see what the cost is. Is, it that, you know, is the data you're gathering that valuable? And some of these scenarios we talked about is definitely a value to push that cap that capability out to the edge. It's a good question. Any other questions, comments? Am I smoking? <laughs> no? You guys are too easy. Except for Mark. What? Comment a little bit on the OpenStack stuff in yeah. the background. Uh, so very much like what Robert was saying, you can end up fairly easily with form factor this side by this size yeah. by this as a single store server, deploy two of those, doesn't take up a whole lot more space. So you're talking about maybe a cubic foot or a little right. bit more of total space. That gives you a two node configuration with HA for OpenStack with hyper converged on top of that. There you go. Yeah, you don't have to have the full data center out there. Right. Really what you're you're wanting to be able to do, yeah, your form factor could be yeah. a Raspberry Pi, right? could be very small, the, the key is, can I manage that? Can I life cycle that, right? Can I, can I have it when stack brings? It has, exactly. And, and what I've seen over the years is people will try, you know, that particular technology is heavy, so instead of figuring out how to scale it, they'll invent their own. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you've soon implemented your own Kubernetes or your own open stack, and now you've got the technical debt to maintain that going forward, and that's a real problem. Exactly. That's why I said you want consistent so you just made my point. Thank you. I'll let you talk now. <laughs> because my point earlier was you want that consistency from the core, right? If you don't, you end up exactly the scenario you're talking about where my, I got this beast out there at the end that I got to maintain. And that's, that's the oil pipeline problem, right? They've created these, these monolithic beasts out there that are chewing up satellite time to, to you know, take time slices off of sensors. All right, which goes back to our point, you need the proper architecture. Um, believe it or not, mo a lot of people hike up Angel's Landing, so it's like a seven-mile hike in sandals. You know? <laughs> and you're sitting there on this cliff edge in sandals. So, there's, so back to my article, right? The eight reasons not to hike uh, Angel's Landing is if you think it's no big deal to wear slip-on shoes, you probably shouldn't hike it. Right, so get get boots or hiking shoes. And I equate this to make sure you got the proper architecture, which is what we were talking about. You need to ensure you've got the proper architecture. And so, just to relate it a little bit to SUSE, right? So we've we've rolled out SUSE's rolled out what we call the software defined infrastructure, and that infrastructure, it's it's got OpenStack, it's built OpenStack in there, but it's all the other pieces that you're going to want to leverage, right? The storage, the networking, and so forth. Even down to the multimodal operating system, right? I can put that, scale that operating system down to put it on a Raspberry Pi out there at the sensor edge. 
all the way up to you know the number crunching on the mainframe or whatever. So I can span that across that model to fit what I need. So my last slide here. So if I can leverage the software-defined infrastructure, right, I can push that power out to the edge. And so I can meet the demands where I've got that massive data growth out there. I can meet that. I can, uh, I'm, I'm not really talking about moving workloads around as much as we're pushing workloads out to that edge, right? Instead of doing all that computing at the core, I'm pushing that capability further out to the edge, right? And I'm, I'm creating and accessing and developing new applications, solutions that are providing my customers new features, new functionality, new services out there at that edge. So the customers are having better experience, right? Which is my competitive edge. That's actually what's driving people to this is your competitors. If you don't do it, they will. Your customers will shop there, right? So we're creating that user experience and we're gonna have to do that with better connectivity. So. All right, um, so that's kind of a high level develop, where's Manuel? There he is. Um, this gentleman is going to be speaking tomorrow. He's gonna go into more technical depth, look at it from a developer's perspective. So we, we got to play with the fun stuff and talk about the business use and so forth. He's gonna delve a little deeper in his session tomorrow, so I invite you to go check that out. Any questions or comments? Rotten tomatoes. Okay. You have comment or are you what? You had what Dave says that they're having to pull together to do data track. Sorry, what's the question? I can't hear you. Do you have any opinions on Do I have any opinions? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a touchy question. Do I have any opinions on the data that's being gathered on this with? No. No. The oh. oh, the structure that's. Oh, the structure that's being needed to process all this data uh, for an augmented workforce. Uh, there's all kinds of structure. There's all kinds of new technologies. There's a lot of it's machine learning, AI type of stuff that's happening in that space, right? Uh, particularly if you're rolling out robots that are servicing customers, they have to be continually learning to be able to answer and respond to the questions, right? It's not so hard if you're just creating a robot that's going to scan the shelves and tell you what item is missing. But if you wanted to interact with the customers, then you're, you're talking machine learning AI. So a lot of what we're talking here is all these new technologies, the machine learning AI, um, uh, you know, security through blockchains, and all, this, all the fun technologies are, are going to get implemented through clear out to the edge. So, great question. Any other questions? All right, thank you. That was fun. <laughs>